Welcome to another study in the book of Acts. The more I do this, the more I realize how important it is to have someone to share with. As I prepare, I look forward to uh, this time when I'm able to get uh, an audience and share what I've learned. It's like having a good joke and no one to share with. And it's good, though, to have someone to share something with. The same is true regarding uh, events in our life. You know, unfortunately, it, there are more uh, tellers than there are listeners. So I think one of the things this happens to do is to help us understand how important it is to be a good listener. So that you will not have any distractions, I'm going to take myself away from the screen, but obviously I'll st still be here. Also, I mentioned that somewhere along the way, there may be things that I cannot read because of the things that are on my screen. So I hope you will uh, ignore that when I come to that point, but I hope uh, nothing will interfere with it. So let's begin uh, and continue the journey with Paul on his third missionary journey. It's hard to keep some of these uh, separate, but I'm going to carry through some uh, maps and other things that might help you to see the places and perhaps even to identify some of the people that you study in these ancient texts. So we begin this, and of course the um, title uh, of this lesson for those who are doing sort of the Bible is Motives. Uh, and uh, all of us do different things, and sometimes there's is a not a, a good motive for what we do. And so uh, we have to be careful that we do things with the right motive. And this seems to be the uh, focus of the passage. Now, we're going to do it verse by verse, but at the conclusion out there are three points that we will spend just a brief time on uh, for those of you who will be teaching the lesson in your class. Uh, I'll point out those three uh, focus texts. So we begin the journey uh, to Ephesus. And of course, as Luke writes this, he tells us about Paul's journey there and uh, to a city that he has visited before and established a church there, even took uh, Priscilla and Aquila they are to help with the ministry, but also uh, there was a, a man named Apollos who came from Corinth to be a part of that. You may recall that it was uh, Priscilla and Aquila that had to uh, introduce and to tell uh, Apollos, who was a very learned and learned man, uh, that he needed to increase or to expand his preaching of baptism to include the preaching and the baptism of Jesus, not just the baptism of John. And we'll look at what makes the difference uh, in those two things as we get to the text. But it is a city that was uh, filled with a lot of uh, corruption. It was uh, a very well-educated city, but it seems the more educated you, there are, people are, the more uh, influenced they are by wicked things. But Paul begins his ministry this time on his third journey uh, in Ephesus. And we'll look at how he made the journey uh, to uh, this place. He arrives in Ephesus, traveling across the interior through Galatia and Phrygia. He is coming from Antioch. Antioch was where Christians were first called Christians. It seemed to be the hub of activity uh, and certainly the springboard for Paul when he went on his mission trips. And so he came from Antioch. 
He went through those regions encouraging churches along the way at Derby and Lystra, Iconium, and he was making his way to Ephesus where he, he spoke for three months just in the synagogue, but he stayed even two, more than two years longer. And it was there that he encountered many things. And it was here that uh, he his extraordinary power uh, through the miraculous works of God were evident through Paul's hands here. And so that is a portion. And then there were the demons that came out. There are many people who, who deny that there are uh, beings such as demons, but it's hard to deny uh, demons in the New Testament. Uh, and it's interesting that it were seven sons of Sceva, who was a Jew. Now, the word seven, of course, you remember it was, I believe, uh, Job, who had uh, seven sons. He had, a, and that's a, a number of perfection. And so the seven sons were the ones casting out demons, but fail. And we'll look at that story when we get to the text. Uh, I don't know that this was the first book burning, uh, but it very well may have been. I don't recall in other places in the New Testament or the Hebrew Bible where books were burned. But, but uh, some of you may know that and you can uh, send me that information. But there were converts there who, uh, upon following Christ and seeing that Artemis, the god of silver, the god of silver, uh, made by the silversmiths, a temple uh, dedicated to Artemis or Diana. Uh, and we'll look at that. Uh, a rendering of that temple. And also, I believe I have the ruins of that temple. But there's this, these were the converts from that pagan uh, practice of worshiping a false image. And uh, eventually, of course, we'll see how, as always is the case, God's word uh, leads to repentance and is transformational when it does. But we don't get out of uh, Ephesus without there being a big riot. And in that riot, we'll uh, talk about crowd mentality. And that's something we need to be aware of. Even in our day, when crowds are excited or they seem to do things that individually on their own, they would not do. So we'll look at that when we we'll get to that text. Now, these are the highlights uh, of the text that uh, impact the gospel in Ephesus. Now, this is a map. You see at the right, the Antioch uh, place of beginning and the route that uh, Paul is taking across the interior all the way back to Ephesus. Along the way, he stopped and he encouraged those churches that he had established uh, earlier, and we see how he moves across. And according to Luke, uh, in these five verses, there's an enormous amount of time uh, that is included in just verses 8 through 12, and we'll look at uh, that when we get there. But it's always helpful to me when I'm able to look at the place where an ancient uh, event is occurring, but also to try to identify the people uh, on that in that same mission, it's helpful to me to solidify that in my mind. I hope it will be for you. But this is, I think, a very good map depicting this leg of the third journey, of course, he continues on beyond this. But for now, this is what we are looking at. Now, Ephesus, as you see, this ruins of the ancient uh, city uh, was a Roman province 
uh, on the coast of what now is Turkey. Uh, it's one of 12 cities in the League of Classical Greek era. But we also know that as, the, Rome, as Rome, the Romans occupied at this time, uh, that there's great Roman influence as we read, particularly uh, how the laws were applied and what rights people had in that day. But there were, according to estimates, 33 to 56,000 people who lived in this Roman uh, province in Asia Minor, the third largest of those cities. But there was a temple to Artemis. Uh, it's an amazing, and we'll see a rendering uh, of, of an artist rendering of that temple. It's one of the seven wonders of the ancient world. Of course, you remember that it was Ephesus that is included in the book of Revelation, and uh, they are charged with leaving their first love, that is the love of God, Christ, in order to worship these false gods. But here they are in the midst of this needy city. And of course, I think that is the example of what we are about too. We need to be in strategic places where we are needed and where the gospel can be preached. Well, Apollos, while Apollos was in Corinth now, that's where Apollos came from at Corinth. Uh, and Paul, of course, was over on completely across the Mediterranean, completely a uh, long way east of where Apollos came from. But here, uh, Paul took that road out of Antioch and he made his way across Ephesus where that where he found some disciples. And he asked them in verse two, did you receive the Holy Spirit when you believed? Now, uh, 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 Priscilla and Aquila had already addressed this issue earlier with uh, Apollos. And of course, the answer was no, we have not. Uh, he, he asked them about the Holy Spirit. They had not understood the Holy Spirit. Now, John's uh, the preaching of the gospel was done, and John's preaching of the gospel, uh, or John's baptism, was a call to repentance. And Jesus' baptism is a call looking to the anticipation of the coming of Christ. Here, he asked the question about the Holy Spirit. They were unfamiliar with it. And so in verse 3, Paul asked, so Paul asked, then what baptism did you receive? John's baptism, they replied, which did not include the full understanding of the baptism of repentance, of, that is the baptism of Jesus symbolizing death, burial, resurrection and the coming again of Christ. So in verse four, Paul said John's baptism was a baptism of repentance. He told the people to believe in the one coming after him that is in Jesus. On hearing this, they were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. And then when Paul laid hands on them, uh, things began to happen. The Holy Spirit came, and the evidence of the Holy Spirit was in the glossolalia, or the speaking in tongues, and those people prophesied or told forth what I understand to be the truth. Now, the glossolalia movement has been a, a movement that's been of controversy. There are those of you who perhaps have a prayer language that's a, in an unknown tongue, but there are things given in other texts that describe how, if indeed a person exercises 
that gift in public, there must be uh, certain ramifications and guidelines, but uh, I do not object to anybody who in their prayer life enters into that kind of conversation. It is not something that's a part of my uh, com prayer conversation, but that's a personal thing, and I don't think we'll ever uh, fully understand the controversy or the confusion between the uh, tongues in the tongues movement. Now, when we emphasize that as being a gift that is uh, required for salvation, then we have gone too far. Then verse seven uh, says there were about 12 men in all. And then verse, uh, we continue, Paul entered the synagogue, which was the normal way that Paul uh, and the path that he took whenever he went to a town, known or unknown, he would go to the synagogue. You recall that after the diaspora, that's when the synagogue appeared because no one had a temple after the temple was destroyed in 722 and the people scattered. So the synagogue was made up it had, there had to be as many as 10 male members in order for there to be a synagogue. You may recall at the beginning of the work in uh, Philippi, when Paul arrived there, there were not, not enough men for a synagogue, but Lydia and uh, her gather, people had gathered down by the river. But here, there was a synagogue and he went there, and as a, uh, going there, he was invited because he was known to be a rabbi, and he began to speak boldly there, arguing persuasively, persuasively about the kingdom of God. Now, when a Jewish rabbi was invited, they expected him to take the law and the prophets uh, and... Uh, spend time uh, exhorting and teaching from the uh, from the old, from the Hebrew Bible but he was a Christian and we remember his conversion experience and he saw Jesus as the Messiah the fulfillment of the Old Testament prophet prophecy and many of these people did not believe that did not understand that and uh, verse 9 describes how they responded to that. They became obstinate. They simply rejected it. And uh, then publicly, it says in verse uh, 9, they refused to believe and publicly maligned the way, misrepresented the way. And again, that's the description of Christians that to me is one of the best descriptions of who we are. Uh, when Jesus invited us to the open way, uh, the broad way and the narrow gate, it's the narrow gate that leads to life everlasting. So we are people following Christ uh, in a disciplined way, and I love being called a person of the way, identifying with Christ. So Paul left them. He took the disciples with him and had discussions daily in the lecture hall of uh, Tyrannius. Now, we have seen the ruins of that rec uh, hall earlier, but let me show it to you again. And when you enter into uh, Ephesus, uh, you would come in uh, several different directions, but you would immediately see this large area that simply are the ruins of that day. According to my research, this is not only the lecture hall, but these ruins are an indicator. The lecture hall was somewhere, uh, some say it was built earlier, but nonetheless, this is the uh, famous uh, Celsius Library 
and then there's an inscription there uh, before the library was built uh, and uh, about the lecture hall. But that's where Paul did his lecture. As I understand it, from my research, to the left uh, of the library is the uh, gym, gym, gymnasium, which is the uh, public place uh, of the where they uh, exercise, and it was, uh, I believe, a bath as well. And of course, as I understand it, there was a brothel house nearby, and actually, uh, there were tunnels underneath the ground going to the brothel houses and uh, a man could go and say I'm well I'm going to the library to study and enter those t tunnels and uh, mischievously uh, be uh, unfaithful to his wife now that's the kind of place this is and of course we have seen and we'll see it again the uh, the rendering of the uh, the temple of Artemis or Diana. But that's uh, where he was lecturing at the time, and that's uh, where he went to, to lecture. And people gathered when he uh, gathered there to lecture. But he went there and he, he engaged the people in conversation. And according to the text in verse 10, this went on for two years so that all the Jews and Greeks who lived in the province of Asia heard the word of the Lord. Now, think about this, 33 to 35,000 people. In a two-year period, I'm sure that all these people had an opportunity to maybe even meet Paul and to at least hear him. And so he continued in public places uh, to preach the gospel. And, of course, he ran into all kinds of uh, barriers and resistance as he did. While he was there, in verse 11, God did extraordinary miracles through Paul. Again, reminding us that miraculous things that occur are the work of God. We are instruments. Now, you, many people will take uh, things and make them the idol. And we see in verse uh, 12, so that even the handkerchiefs and the aprons that had touched them were uh, given to, uh, uh, to, uh, were, were taken to the sick and their illnesses were cured and the evil spirits left them. Now, again, our lesson is about motives. We see in our day, in all of my life, I have witnessed and have heard observed preachers who have taken these kinds of things out of context and have given them out, taught with the wrong motive. Well, in this case, it was the expansion or the extension of the work of those early uh, disciples and apostles, those who were working with Paul. Uh, he used that to... Uh, really increase his ability. Well, in verse 13, so Jews went about driving out, uh, so G some Jews went about driving out evil spirits, tried to invoke the name of the Lord Jesus over those who were demon-possessed. They would say, in the name of Jesus, whom Paul preaches, I command you to come out. And, of course, they had the wrong motive, and they failed. Verse, seven, uh, verse 14 describes those seven sons that I mentioned earlier of Sceva, a Jewish priest, and they were doing this. However, uh, as they were doing that one day, they had a surprise. And I can imagine 
how uh, surprising and uh, alarming this may have been. One day, the evil spirit answered them, and he said to them, Jesus I know, and Paul I know, but who are you? And of course, they met the evil spirit very soon uh, after this conversation. It says, then the man who had the evil spirit jumped on them and overpowered them all. He gave them such a beating that they ran out of the house naked and bleeding as they ran away. So you would have to say in that day that those seven sons were believers and demons because it was face-to-face -face and hand combat that they encountered. So I would say that thereafter, they were able to give a testimony of what it is to meet evil face to face. And they encountered that. And even the demons recognized the difference between Paul, Jesus, and those who had the wrong motives. And so that's a very interesting uh, an event. Well, the people here, they were afraid when they saw this happening. Verse 17, when this became known to the Jews and Greeks living in Ephesus, they were all seized with fear, and the name of the Lord was held high in, in high held in high honor. Uh, when they saw the power of the miracles and the power of God, obviously it caused many of them to respond, respond in a positive way. But always there are going to be the naysayers, those who will continue to reject and refuse. And verse 18 says uh, what we all know happened. Many of them now came and openly confessed uh, what they had done. But of course, there were the sorcerers. And of course, we will find uh, Demetrius later in the text who responds in a negative way. And there were a number of sorcerers uh, in the area and did something uh, publicly that uh, was unexpected when they believed. And I'll show you, this is a uh, ancient uh, rendering. Uh, well, really, I think it's a discovery uh, of uh, a picture in ancient walls uh, where the, uh, of course, we know in that day, your text may say books, but my text says scrolls, which is the accurate way because there were no bound books in that day. And the scrolls were brought and uh, they were burned because these people realized that this was false stuff that they were, uh, 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 the, the magic that they were practicing. So they came and burned those as evidence of what uh, Christ had done in their life. Now, uh, that, as I mentioned earlier, may have been the first public book burning. I'm a little surprised that it was the 50,000 dramas were not more than I discovered the calculation in today's money would be, uh, according to what I researched, it would have amounted to $161.25. But nonetheless, they were destroying documents that were not easily put together. Uh, those scrolls were considered to be valuable to them. And this is the amount. Uh, verse 20 uh in this way, the word of the Lord spread widely and grew in power. People could not deny, and you know how it is when 
an event occurs, people begin to talk. And I'm sure by the way of uh, the tongue to the ear, that people began to talk about what was happening. Uh, verse 21, after all this happened, Paul decided to go to Rome, passing through uh, Macedonia and Achaia. After I have been there, he said, I must visit Rome. But of course, we know that's a, a later trip. He sent two of his helpers, Timothy and Erastus, to Macedonia while he stayed in Asia a little longer. And of course, He's staying there to see really what's going to happen, and it really happens. Again, in verse 23, he uses my favorite term for uh, those who follow Christ. Uh, there arose a great disturbance about the way. And, of course, they are speaking about those who acknowledge Christ as their Savior and are following him. But then we meet Demetrius. It appears to me that uh, any time the Christian message and a man's pocketbook or billfold runs awry, most of the time the billfold wins. Well, Demetrius was a silversmith who made uh, his living uh, with the scrying uh, from the silver that he made uh, when he made the images of Artemis. And, of course, uh, Artemis was uh, the uh, uh, temple to uh, Diana, but we'll also see that uh, there are little uh, uh, images that he made, and that's how he made his living. Well, the businessman called everybody together. He called them together along with the workers and, relate, and, and, and he got their trade union together and said, you know, my friends, that we receive good income from this business. Uh, and he, of course, is looking after his business income. And so he begins to address it in this way. And you see and hear how this is uh, how Paul has conceived and led astray large numbers of people here in Ephesus and in, and in the whole province of Asia. He says that gods made by human hands are not gods at all. Now, as I, list, as I read that, I re realized what a great description any time that we can make something in our hands and begin to worship it, we would have to say it is an idol, not a God. One who worships a God that controls him is controls him or he controls is an idol worshiper. Only a God that like we know that is Yahweh. Only Yahweh is our creator. He's the one that created us. And uh, they could not see that this, oh, and I, one thought came to me that an I-D-O-L, an idol, is I-D-L-E, that is idol. An idol is idol. He has no power. And so these were simply idols, icons that they worship. And then verse 23, there's a danger, not only that our trade will lose its good name, then he appeals to their worship, but also the temple of the great goddess Artemis will be discredited. And, uh, and, and he goes on to say that this will remove and rob her of her divine majesty. Again, not protecting uh, the people, not having the interest of the people in mind, but only his interest, the wrong motive once again. His motive was not to 
lead these people to truth and understanding, but his motive was to protect his business so that he can further uh, his income. It had really nothing to do with truth. And therefore, uh, we find that there is a riot that is incited. In verse 29, when they heard this, they were furious and began shouting, Great is Artemis of the Ephesians. Now, I made this way. Very few times do I respond, even in a worship service, when I'm called upon to respond to something uh, simply because uh, the leader is asking me to do it. There's something about inciting other people in a persuasive way in that manner that is just not my nature. Therefore, uh, I'm always concerned about crowd activity, uh, even ball games. And when we gather in thousands to cheer on teams, we hear uh, the kinds of language and against one another as if we are enemies. And of course, if you observe European uh, football, soccer, in those places often break out in riots. Well, this is what was happening, but it had the dimension of religion included. Political rallies can do this. Uh, social rallies do this. Large crowds that are incited for or against the cause, we need to be very careful as we engage in that. Verse 29 says that the whole city was in an uproar. And then uh, they seized two of Paul's companions, Gaius and Aristarchus. Uh, I don't know that they're mentioned anywhere else, but they uh, were from the region of Macedonia. And uh, all of them rushed into the theater, all wanted to, go up and speak before the crowd, but the disciples would not let him. The people would not let Paul go before the crowd. I recall trying to persuade a man, I carried a group camping in my first congregation, and during that time, we were approached by a man who had a tire tool and he was inebriated. Being a young preacher, I tried to appeal to his good nature and discovered that you cannot appeal to the nature of a drunken man. Well, I'm sure these people, using good judgment, understood that you could not appeal to a crowd that had been incited as this crowd had been incited. incited. And so it, I think it was in good uh, reason that they said, no, this is not the time. In verse 31, though, I think is a good, uh, 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 we'll see how the Roman law became important which reflects our own laws, or our own, own laws reflect theirs. Even some of the officials of the province, friends of Paul, sent him a message begging him not to go to the venture, to, or to, vent, uh, to venture into the theater. It's not that Paul was afraid, but those knowing the nature of a crowd knew that in that kind of confusion, there is no reason, no way to reason uh, with people. That's uh, expressed in verse 32. The assembly was in, in confusion. Some of the people were shouting one thing and some another. Most of the people did not even know why they were there. Isn't that interesting? If you examine much of the 
in many of the interviews that you hear about people who are in uh, a large crowd gathering for a cause for or against, many of them aren't even aware of what is going on, uh, even what the cause is. Well, that's the nature, uh, and that is what is known as crowd mentality. But then there was a Jew who apparently was a leader in, uh, among the Jews, and we know nothing about him other than he was just a leader, and they pushed Alexander into the front, and he shouted instructions to them. He motioned for silence in order to uh, make a defense before the people. But then they even grew louder when they realized that this was a Jew, and they shouted for two hours, great is Artemis of the Ephesians. We've heard crowds shout, shouting those kind of things in political gatherings, in uh, social justice gatherings, in religious gatherings, on and on we can say that crowd mentality is, can, is and can be a very uh, precarious and even dangerous place. Well, then it's interesting to me that a city clerk uh, no, no name given. A city clerk quieted the crowd and said, and this is where the law comes in. He simply says, fellow citizens or fellow Ephesians, don't, doesn't all the world know that the city of Ephesus is the guardian of the temple of the great Artemis and of her image, which fell from, fell from heaven? Therefore, since these facts are undeniable, you ought to calm down and do nothing rash. If indeed what we say is true is what he is saying, and the whole world knows this, why is that a threat to you? Then he goes on to say, these are undeniable facts and you ought to abide by that. Further in verse 37, you have brought these men here Though, though they have neither robbed temples nor blasphemed our goddess. So the charges are false. Then in verse 20, uh, 38, he appeals to them to follow the law. If then Demetrius and his fellow craftsmen have a griev grievance against anybody, the courts are open and so are the pro councils. They can do press charges. Now, we know that our legal system has become uh, very uh, convoluted and uh, very difficult to follow. It's almost <clears throat> as if only the ones with large sums of money can get through the legal system. But nonetheless, this is the basis of our own legal system, and he is uh, reflecting, or our laws are reflecting what was known as uh, the, the uh, Roman law. Well, he said in verse 39, if there is anything further you want to bring up, it must be settled in a legal, legal assembly. He, he was saying rioting is not the way to do it. We have a way to do that. And you have go gone about it in the wrong way. Verse 40, as it is, we are in da danger of being charged with rioting because of what happened today. In other words, he is saying a similar thing that we've seen played out in recent days in our country that people have been accused of inciting a riot and many of them charged or charged. And I, in my opinion, uh, not in a good way and are in prison today uh, as a result of some being there for a good reason, but got caught up in a riot 
and were charged and were convicted of that. And of course, after this, he dismissed the assembly. Uh, riots never solve an issue. In our history, we could go back and enumerate a number of bad things that have happened as a result of rioting. We've seen it in our streets, and uh, it's always been very ugly. For those of you who are teaching this lesson on the motives and the wrong motives, uh, we need these are the focal passages. First of all, to recognize the power of God. Uh, it's quite evident that God was doing some extraordinary things to Paul. And there are all kinds of ways that you can uh, approach this. I would suggest uh, a, a book that, or a, a, yes, a book and many films and et cetera have been made from a book called God Winks. And it is a similar kind of book to the Paul Harvey stories or the Max Lucado stories that uh, demonstrate through extraordinary circumstances when we hear the rest of the story as Paul Harvey says it, we see that God was at work all the time. So if we wait on God's power, as someone said years ago to me, those who wait on the Lord never lose any time. But we have to be aware that there are people who are uh, wolves in sheep's clothing. They uh, do not have the right motives. I've seen many people advance their own causes because they uh, have, they have used religion and et cetera to advance their own causes. And they had the wrong motive in what they were doing. That's quite evident uh, in the scenes as they unfold here with the Jews, Jewish priest and his sons who are trying to cast out demons. And, and then they meet the demon face to face and they get judgment on them. False motives often are exposed in ways that are surprising. But we recognize that in life, God is our authority. And this is what Paul was teaching these people, is that when we go with the right motive and share the gospel with other people, that people will come to understand the authority of God. And verse 20, 20, I think, it just tells us exactly how the gospel will spread whenever we follow and understand that it is through God's authority that we work. He says in verse 20, in this way, the word of the Lord spread widely and grew in power. When we see the evidence of God working in our lives and we share that testimony, that's where our testimony is so important. We give evidence of the power of God and his authority in our life. Once again, I thank you for joining me uh, on this journey and I pray that as the days unfold for each of us, that we will always have the right motive when we go about doing the work of God, remembering what happened to Paul in the city of Ephesus, Ephesus in that ancient day. Father, how grateful that we have the power of God in our lives. Help us to know that you are the one who gives us the authority to do what we do. We go in that knowledge and strength, Father, to face a hostile world that needs to know who you are. Give us courage and strength to do that. For Christ's sake, I pray. Amen.